Hello, and welcome to Narrative Design for the Computer Gaming Industry. We've got a fabulous panel lined up for, for you here, and we're going to be looking at narrative design, what that is, and what a little bit about what the work is like. Um, so we're going to start by introducing our panel here. Um, Anne, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Ann Toole. I am based in Los Angeles, and I am a freelance writer of games and comics and other things. Uh, I have worked on Horizon Zero Dawn and the last DLC for Assassin's Creed Origins and more stuff coming to a console near you. John? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, I'm John Zero Platten. Everybody calls me JZP. Uh, I've been writing video games now for going on 30 years. I uh, wrote my first game for the Sega CD back in 1991. Um, since then, I've written about 80, 80 uh, video games across every platform you can imagine. Uh, probably my biggest flex of late uh, was I was one of the original people at Niantic who created Ingress and Pokemon Go. And so I was very involved in the AR, VR elements of that uh, that particular uh, game. Um, and I've also recently written uh, Jurassic World uh, Evolution. So I do a lot of big properties and touch a lot of big franchises, uh, as well as Ghostbusters, uh, uh, which was for Planet Coaster. Uh, I've got some games that are announcing literally in the next few days. So uh, getting ready for those and uh, looking forward to the discussion. And Lauren? Um, I'm Lauren Stone. I am technically a writer at Massive uh, Ubisoft Studio in Sweden, but I'm on a mission for the last, a little bit over a year uh, with Reflections in Newcastle in the UK. And so I am the Clancy Narrative Specialist currently. I've been with Ubisoft for a little bit over six years, which is a little insane to think about. Um, and I've worked on, I've shipped more IPs than years I've been in the industry, which I think is kind of funny and very atypical. <laughs> um, and my first official job in games was actually as a voice actor. And so I was the voice of Lillian Becca in State of Decay. So I switched sides of the table to uh, increase representation by writing the stories instead of voicing them. That's great. All right. And Neil? Uh, well, hi. Uh, uh, I'm Neil Halford. Uh, I have worked in the game industry since 1990. Uh, I'm kind of the RPG guy. I uh, worked on a, a lot of older classic titles, uh, the Might and Magic series, uh, a Betrayal of Crondor, uh, Dungeon Siege. Uh, those are some of the ones that are probably I'm better known for. Uh, I've been kind of working in the indie space for the past couple of years. Oh, and our, our, uh, we have uh, one of our other guests that is actually popping in. So I'm going to go ahead and drop her in here. Um, mm. So, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, so I've been in, in doing this for, for a number of years. And uh, also, I co-wrote a book with Jaina uh, up here in the corner, our, our lovely moderator, uh, called Swords and Circuitry, a Designer's Guide to Computer Role-Playing Games. And so that was used for a number of years on camp campuses. And so uh, narrative is, is still sort of my, my main wheelhouse, but I have done other aspects of design. So. Great. All right. And then welcome, Leanne. Um, can you introduce yourself, uh, please? Sure. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, my name is Leanne Taylor-Giles. I've been working at Ubisoft Montreal for about the past six years, and now I am the narrative lead on Drop Bear Bites in Australia. Great. Well, I'm so glad to, to we're so glad to have you with us. Thank you. So um, I know when, you know, we, this panel is, is something that we have um, covered this topic in past Comic-Cons. And so something that um, always makes up a good part of our audience are people who are interested in um, getting into the field, um, so sometimes games in general, but very often people interested in the storytelling narrative aspect of that. So um, would you, um, would the panel please tell us um, a little bit about what training or background you have as a writer um, before you became a narrative designer, or if you, um, are someone that, that, that just jumped in and, you know, maybe you pulled from other life experiences or, or, or work to, to transition into that. Uh, and I know some of you have gone back and forth between other types of writing or done it all simultaneously. So anyway, if you tell a little bit about your background um, and or training, that might be um, illuminating to people that, that just want to know, because I know everybody's got a somewhat different story. So um, who would like to start off on that? I'll go. 
Uh, I'll just be quick. Um, my undergraduate degree is in archaeology, so everyone obviously needs to get an archaeology degree to be a writer in games. I'm sorry, I didn't make the rules. Well, um, obviously, but, yes. But it actually has... That um, explains Assassin's Creed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why I was like, yeah, I'm going to go live in Bulgaria because it was actually literally exactly what I had studied. I brought my senior thesis to work. <laughs> so I was like, yes, yeah, finally monetizing that degree. Um, but it's, it is very helpful uh, in terms of, because it was part of the anthropology department. So it's about cultures and, and uh, not being, you know, as, as we would say today, trying not to be a colonizer about it, you know. And um, so I think it's very helpful to have that as a background. But I started in TV as a, you know, as assistant and started writing for TV. But as a lifelong gamer, I kept going to conferences and uh, I finally made the, made the jump to games. So that's my background. Awesome. John, you looked ready to chime in. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a junior college dropout. <laughs> I didn't know I wanted to be a writer. Um, I worked uh, below the line at Universal, Universal Studios for about seven years uh, in television production, mostly as an assistant coordinator and a production coordinator on a bunch of shows. And uh, back at that time, uh, you basically had to run the scripts. There was no electronic distribution. Everything was basically paper. And so I would go through literally reams and reams of paper every day. Um, but part of my part of my job uh, uh, was breaking down the scripts and sending them out to department heads. So over the course of about six or seven years of me doing this, I'm reading scripts literally on a daily basis and breaking them down. And you start to kind of get a feel for what works and what doesn't work and how story structure is, is laid out. And so one day I went to the producer of the show I was working on and said, hey, I think I could write one of these. And they said, prove it. So <laughs> over a Thanksgiving weekend, I wrote a Spec Seinfeld script. And, uh, and I brought it to him. And uh, basically, his, his response to me was, OK, I'll look at it and let's see what, see what you got. Calls me back into his office at, the lunch, uh, at lunch hour and says, do you want the good news or the bad news? And I thought, hmm, OK, uh, give me the bad news. And he says, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, holy crap, what's the good news? <laughs> he says, I'm hiring you back as a writer on the show. And uh, that's how I started writing. And uh, since then, I've written, you know, so much stuff. And, and I, I consider myself an everyday learner, so I'm still kind of learning every day when I write. But, um, but yeah, that's my story. That's how I, I started as a writer. Um, and then fairly quickly found my way into the game space uh, through uh, some early Sega CD stuff. Um, and the game space is where I love to live. So I also write comic books and television and movies and all that other stuff. But the uh, the video game space is far and away my favorite my favorite place to be. Um, when I was I went back to school when I was older when I was like twenty six um, and got a degree in creative writing. And one of the best things that they said to me was like, "You can be good, like and talented, and you can be professional, and you can be." like likable. And if you're all three of those things, you'll work all the time. You don't have to be all three. You just have to be two of the three. You can be an asshole who delivers on time and your work is good. You'll work all the time. And so it's like, as long as you're two of the three, you're good. If you're all three, then you've hit the pinnacle. You'll work forever and you'll be good to go. And so it's always like, be nice, be fun, be good, be on time, professional. Don't be a dick. And like, if you're talented, bonus right like we'll get you there if you're like we will mentor you we'll make you a better person um but so just you saying that i'm like yeah no that's that's the most real and also i'm from california so like i have a feeling similar background in that respect um i grew up as a children's musical theater actor and like was in a co production company and started working for them when i was 16 and then would like i ran an after school musical theater program and like my first job writing was like adapting plays for like inner city kids who had to sing about hating turnips and like getting them to work together and so it's like if i can do that i can make game developers ship a game like not an issue um but that my background is like being a children's musical theater person and then uh was a union actor in LA for a very long time. SAG, uh, at WGA struck and wasn't allowed to work. And so I'm like, I'm gonna write stuff for me because people don't write stories for pudgy half Asian chicks. It's not a thing, uh, not in early 2000s at least. Uh, and so I went back to school, got a degree in creative writing, uh, met my now ex-husband who was a video game developer and through that relationship spent 
like five years trying to not get into games for fear of nepotism and the perception of nepotism, even though I had a degree in creative writing and he had a degree in computer animation and he was the video game writer. And so I ended up doing that spouse thing where you support people and you accidentally rewrite video games for people that they don't know about it. And it's fine. So you have accidental non-official credits on very large games that you're not allowed to talk about. So like, that's a thing that happened. And then uh, we were living in Montreal and I wasn't allowed to work in my field. And I was like, I have a degree. Like I have a degree in this. I know that you just lost some writers and Leanne and I actually worked together. So like I squeed cause I didn't know it was this Leanne until I saw her face. <laughs> so, like, you'll go back and see me like, ah! and just be very thankful that I was muted. Um, but yeah, and so like we worked together and like, I had only been in games for like maybe a month before Leanne and I started working together and I was the only writer on a project. Right. And so like I took my, my first job was eight week contract to help out on Rainbow Six Siege. And then at the end of my first week, they asked me to stay longer. At the end of two months, I was, it was me and the lead writer and the end of three months, it was just me. And I took that game from Alpha to shipping by myself and it's a behemoth now. And yeah my story makes no sense because it's just my story and reality has no narrative logic. <laughs> this is, this is so true. This is so true. And thank you for that. Really some of the best career advice I have ever heard about, you know, the, the, the being at least two of the three things and to paraphrase, don't be a jerk. And you know, that will, that will go a long ways. And if you are one, or you better be the most productive. Yeah. You must be the, the most, productive. most talented, yes. most talented, most on time. Like it, then you can afford to be an asshole, but it's always yes. better for everyone and the culture <laughs> if you're not. <laughs> yes. Yes. One of and my so, favorite things. Oh, sorry, John. Uh, when I worked on Torment Tides of Numenera and it's something we've brought to Drop Air Bites as well as we have rule zero, which is don't assume the other person is an asshole, which works pretty well as well. And now we also have rule five, which is don't be an asshole. <laughs> So when you're working remotely, you've got people in different time zones all over the world. Someone writes an email at 2 a.m. their time and they're not in the best mood. It really helps to have that rule zero and go, OK, look, I know this person. I like this person. Even if I don't like them, we do good work together. Let's make everything roll as it should and just ignore, you know, the little annoyances of being in different time zones, basically. Well, uh, my particular path in, into the game industry was, uh, of course, I'm uh, John and I are of, of a certain vintage uh, where where uh, we were coming in uh, after that sort of first wave of the the, the first generation of, of game designer folks. Uh, and so I, I fell in love with computer games because of Ali Sheedy. Um, there was a movie called War Games. Um, and, uh, of course I watched that movie and I wanted desperately to be David Lightman, uh, because he was this brilliant computer uh, programmer guy and he could do all this amazing stuff by just sitting there typing and, and graphics would appear on the screen and an amazing thing would happen. But, you know, he was trying to hack into a computer to impress his girlfriend. And so of course I said, well, you know, I want Ali Sheedy, so I'm going to get into games. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I went out and I bought all these books on computer programming. I had my little Atari 400 keyboard, uh, which, which, well, actually didn't have a keyboard. It's just a kind of a membrane. So you're just punching it, you know, trying to make things appear on the screen. It was horrible. Um, but, um, so I bought all these books on programming and after a while I, I realized I really suck at being a programmer. Uh, I'm, uh, this is never, ever going to work. And so, uh, whenever I, I was going into college, I said, well, I'm going to take the things, the stuff that I know that I'm good at. And so I went into radio, television, film production. Uh, and at the same time I was working at a podunk little radio station in Oklahoma, uh, cause I'm originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and I started writing radio dramas because this was a tiny little radio station, which had Arbitron rating ratings that were smaller than anybody ever heard of. And so they didn't really care. And so they, they uh, so I had access to this little tiny recording booth and we started making audio dramas. So flash forward a little bit and a buddy of mine had gotten a job for new world computing, uh, which of course they are the makers of might and magic and some other stuff. And so he said, well, Hey, we need a, a, a writer. And so what I actually I submitted for my writing sample was the stack of scripts for my audio dramas, which, of course, back in the day, it's all about dialogue. 
Uh, and so, uh, so that's actually what got me my first gig in the game industry was a stack of radio dramas. And of course, as weird things have kind of gone by is the past couple of years, uh, I've revived that I'm, I'm actually doing radio dramas again. Uh, and so, uh, that's been, been kind of my semi-retirement hobby has been, you know, uh, working on, on radio dramas, but it's, it's actually a really important skill because honestly, if you can convey everything through voice uh because the thing about it is 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 i mean the computer games the graphics have have starting to kind of catch up to the point where you can show things with characters faces you can do things with their hands but if you can write a really compelling story with really great dialogue uh and you have voice actors that can make that come alive uh i, I really think that that's honestly as of course, we're going to get a little more into what actually what the whole scope of what narrative design is. It's not just, you know, writing dialogue. It's a lot more than that. Uh, but but uh, but again, I, I think that's one of the most important skills if you're going to work in, in this particular field is is uh, be able to write dialogue, write, write stuff that is punchy, that gets the idea across, that gets the emotion across. Uh, if you can write dialogue, that's that's more than half the battle right there. So anyway, that's that's where my my path in the industry. Right. So as you can see, there's multiple ways to do this um, through practical work, through different fields. And I think it's a good argument for those of you that are um, interested in things that people say, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to get a job with that? Well, you know, the, the, whether your background is theater or, um, or, or it is um, archaeology or whatever your passion is, pursue it. And you'll, you can, if you're creative and persistent, can find some way to make that work for you. So um, uh, that's really good to know. I'm going to have to disrupt. I'm going to disrupt the flow just a little bit because this is not the first time this has happened. I didn't introduce myself. Um, I am just the moderator here, but um, I'm Jana Halford. And uh, as Neil mentioned, some um, some time ago, I helped him write a book about the storytelling aspects of, of games. The, that was our first, first Swords and Circuitry production. And uh, so um, besides that, though, I had been writing about popular culture even before I, I met Neil. And now, and Lauren, I'll tell you what going back to school old is. I um, am now in graduate school, and I'm older than all but one of my professors. But I'm having a wonderful time. I'm, I'm getting um, a master's degree in art history and visual culture, which includes, that's of course, awesome. popular culture. Yes, you know, because nice. nowadays, yeah, that's that can cover film and comics and, and games. And I've got colleagues that are focusing very um, heavily on those things. But anyway, you know, there's I've I'm I've um, never really differentiated between what is fine art and what is popular culture and all because there's good and bad in all of those different aspects you know there's things that you oh, yeah. can love and hate <laughs> anywhere so. and most of the time it's just pretension right like the it's it's what we decide as a culture carries more weight is the thing that dictates whether it's fine art or not if you reach yeah, catharsis well, I mean, you've done your job <laughs> right, like, right well this fine yeah, art and all, then it's fine all art. art is subjective Exactly. Right. All art is subjective. And I remember like early on, you know, in my career, uh, one of the big, you know, knocks against video gaming, and it was by a famous uh, film critic, Roger Ebert. He said that basically, you know, there'll never be a video game that'll make you cry. Well, I feel Roger. Wrong. Uh, <laughs> dear, Neil dear Roger, hasn't played Mario like far enough. Dear, dear Roger, I hope you were, I, I wish you were around today to see it because there is so much amazing emotional storytelling now happening in the game space and and he couldn't have been more wrong so yeah so i i think that you know art is what you see and decide is art and that's that can hold true for anything that you're looking at yeah. truly and neil early in your career you got hate mail from parents because you made their kids cry with your storyline I killed, I killed gorath and i still get hate mail because of that no um um <laughs> Um, but, uh, but no, that was actually a pr proud thing. And I remember John Cutter and I having a long discussion about that very issue is that this is the same, that argument was certainly going on in the early nineties ago, you know, computer games can't be art. We can't emotionally move people. And I said, okay, I freaking prove that's not true. Yeah. And, the, and you get these weird things that happen too, as a result of characters you create. So I'm Facebook friends with characters I've created. So like out of <laughs> games from like 15 or 20 years ago, I'm now Facebook friends with these characters. 
and they sometimes come back and wish me a happy birthday, or they, you know, they'll talk to me and they'll respond to me about some topic I wrote. And I thought, hmm, yeah, there's just kind of a, there's kind of, that's kind of the wonderful thing about creation is once you put it into the other people's hands, they tend to run with it and do what they want with it. And that's kind of amazing, you know? And uh, one of the things I really love is when you, have done something well enough that somebody else gets invested in it and wants to be a part of it and wants to take possession of it in you know small p to now run with it the way they want to run with it and uh, so yeah that's I think that's that's a, that's a component of, of the experience as well. That's what narrative design is, right? You're designing yeah. to share the narrative. You want to write something yep. that the player can co-own with you. I oh, yeah. try to write novels and I never get far because I miss that component. I want to be interactive. I want to have a story that the player can talk to their friends about and they get something different out of it and it becomes their story. And it's my story and it's their story and they're not mutually exclusive and they shouldn't be mutually exclusive. It's why games are so powerful. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's a, it's in, and it didn't used to be that way, right? It used to be, you know, you make a game, you ship it, you're done with it. And now you make a game and it becomes a collaboration between you and the players as they either do their own content or as they react to new content as you, as you send it to them through downloadables. Um, so it becomes a living thing rather than, rather than this, this, you know, this piece of archaeology. <laughs> it's, now, it's now a living construct. And that's that reality is not dead. <laughs> it's part of us. I'm really glad that that you brought that up, Leanne, because I was wondering how to seg into um, what narrative design is, and you just naturally naturally did that, probably because you are psychic or something. But um, so, um, do you? Does anyone else want to say something about what narrative design is and well, the important I, aspects of it? Well, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of hop in real quick, which is in, in just because you know there are a lot of people who are viewers. You know, we all know what, we're all familiar with narr narrative design is. Because whenever we all got started, or at least I got started, you're just a writer, <laughs> and then you got became a designer, and now we're narrative designers. Uh, I, I don't know what will be tomorrow, but it'll be interesting. Uh, but um, uh, so it's there's a whole line, there's there's a whole spectrum of stuff that that the word narrative design encompasses. Uh, because the, the main thing, obviously, that everybody's immediately familiar with is, okay, the dialogue that's that you're hearing the characters speak. Uh, but beyond that, we're talking about the design of the world. You know, uh, I'm sitting down and we're, you know, and creating, here's the history of this place. This is the history of this item. This is what it looks like. This is what things sound like. And so you're working, you're creating, the, doing the world building that is, you know, helping uh, create the fabric of what uh, what this place is. And, and even if you are not, you know, some people think world building only applies to if you're doing a fantasy universe or if you were doing a sci-fi universe. But that's not true because uh, whenever you look at, uh, you take, for example, like Sex in the City, you know, uh, that represents a very specific idea about what New York City is, you know. And if you take other, uh, if you take other television programs or other things that are set in New York, if you sit down, if you look at Friends or if you look at whatever, they all represent different ideas about what, New York is. And so as a world builder, even if you're setting something in a contemporary known world setting, you still have to create the universe of your characters. Uh, and so that's part of what narrative design is. And then another aspect is, is that uh, a lot of times you're going to be involved with transmedia stuff because we live in this really strange world where you're, you're no longer just doing the game. You're doing manuals. You might be doing tie-in novels yes, or tie-in comics or, uh, or, or an audio and, drama and an audio drama. It got announced last week. It made me so happy when you started oh. talking about audio dramas, Casey Weiland and I made an audio drama. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, but but anyway, so so it's a blanket term that has to do with anything that has to do with the story of, of the universe. And so some some story is something that you immediately deliver to the player. And some of it is stuff that the player never directly interfaces with. It's what's used to create the universe and informs the how the 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 artists and how the designers and how other people uh, in uh sort of create the world through rules, through the way things look. And so 
that's the blanket idea about what narrative design covers. My current team in Australia working on broken roads, I have a reputation now, which is whenever we look at a level design, I'm like, okay, but where are the toilets? Because <laughs> I just want it to be a real world that people live in. And so long standing joke now, everyone always puts toilets in their maps and it's great. Because otherwise, uh, what do you do? It's the future. It's post apocalyptic wasteland. You know, we have to think about these things. There are mechanical issues there. Uh, I, so. I, I got into to a little bit of a, a tiff one time whenever we were working on Dungeon Siege. And we were, they had a graveyard. And I said, this is really great. Why are all these Christian crosses on all these tombstones? Uh, and I said, I, I don't have a problem with a cross, but you need to understand is like, if, it, if there is a cross, what does it mean in the context of this universe? And you can't just use it generically as to say, well, everybody, that's just what everybody uses to bury their dead. Well, no, actually they don't. Um, and so, um, so again, it's these little tiny, small details that tell you something about the universe. The unintended Wait. narrative that becomes the central narrative is the it, thing that we always have to fight against, especially when it comes to like game design and narrative not talking to each other. And my favorite analogy for this is like, it doesn't matter if your story is about being vegan eco warriors and you're going to like make the world vegan, if your gameplay is murder all the bunnies and eat them. Yes, exactly. Yes, that, that is a definite conflict there. And, and well, I that, love that analogy uh, of the graveyard. Go ahead, go ahead, John. I was going to say, you know, a key component early on in, in the process of development is, is interacting with the game designers, you know, the folks that are focused on mechanics and level building. And, and so we'll have these long discussions where all have story ideas and they have gameplay ideas. And it becomes this, how do I maximize that gameplay idea with interesting narrative? Or how do they take that narrative and convert it into something that can be a really fine gameplay experience? And it's that collaboration that really early on in the process develops the through line for the game. You know, ultimately, people can't get emotionally invested in a game mechanic. They're going to get emotionally invested in the characters. However, you want your characters in your world to be fully supportive of the core game mechanic. That's when you're getting a AAA title. That's when you're getting everything working together seamlessly. And, and the, the gameplay itself should, in essence, be kind of a metaphor for whatever your story is, uh, on, if you put it across the top. So, yeah, you don't want to have a game that's out of sync with the mechanic, right? The, the, the game story would be completely out of sync with your gameplay mechanics. And so unless, unless that's, that's a key component. That if you're doing Sorry? that on purpose to create dissonance, I mean, that can be really interesting. And you can make something interesting as a result. But, you know, I, I, always try and, I always try and, you know, when I'm early on in developing story and developing world, I'm always looking, how can we maximize the gameplay element of this? And do, does this need to be a cinematic? Can this be gameplay? Because if it can be gameplay, that's much preferable. You know, that's a much more preferable situation. So. So I'm always looking at that really early on. And I also and think about that reinforcing story. theme. Yeah, like that if you're doing that, it's something about re like supporting a central theme and reiterating a central theme that you can utilize that. And the more that we support each of those things and they become dependent upon one another, the more important they become and the more invested people become and the less they're going to go, oh, well, that's super annoying. And those small moments that you interact with all the time become the things that people are the most connected to. So you'll write something that costs you $3 to make versus that million dollar cinematic that people press A to skip, right? Like. <laughs> And like we spend so much money on that cinematic, but that's not what we focus on. Yeah. Like that's not what we engage with the most. The barks, like people don't put nearly enough investment in the barks considering how much you actually interact with that and yes. how much that has to do with your world. Yes. And so like, and that's it, like Siege, it's nothing but barks. And like occasionally we'll do some trailers and stuff, but like the basis of that game, what people interact with, it's bark tree. And that oh, bark tree can either create character and it can be, it can ground your world or it can take you out of it. And sometimes you want it, you want to be taken out and you need those characters to do that because you need the light and levity to deal with the darkness. Otherwise it stops having any effect whatsoever. But that's the balance that we can do if we're all working together in a collaborative way and we're seeing the opportunities within the constraints. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the 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 um, uh, the guy to say, okay, we, we just say re just really quickly what barks are just so that our audience- Thank you. You know, <laughs> short lines that are repetitive and typically are attached to stimulus and world conditions and just happen hey, and they're not there, scripted. Ah, no, take cover. Please heal yeah. me. I'm dying. 
Ow. Or yeah. in Siege, I got you. My favorite early part of the process. Early on, we used to refer to those as nags. Because <laughs> they, they function the same way. How involved, can you speak to um, how involved you are or not with other aspects of the games you work on? Do you interact with um, the art or programming? You know, um, talk a little bit about that because, um, particularly because um, often, there are a lot of artists and a lot of programmers and maybe not so many of what you do so um talk a little bit about um about how involved you are and just just what that's like yeah and i'll be quick ahead. um okay. i've worked on a bunch of projects and it definitely varies so i've been on a project where like i was reaching out to someone in another department and they were like don't do that just go through this producer um and i'm like okay that's cool and then I just got off a project where I could literally talk to anybody and they would talk back to me. So I could directly ask the programmer like, oh, what are the flags for this? Like, what is, and they would be like, oh, here's this thing. And th this is how to do it. And they were like, basically teaching me how to program. And I'm like, I don't need that much information, <laughs> but yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so it really, it really varies based on how the project is is organized, but I definitely love when it's it's free reign and you can talk to anybody because then you can have those conversations without playing a game of telephone, basically, where it's like, well, I told the producer more. My favorite thing is getting to meet a new team and encouraging everyone to believe that they are co-storytellers with me. You know, I want to work with the level design, I want to work with the artists, I want to work with the sound designer, the composer, the programmers, everyone. As we've covered, everything that goes in the game is part of the game story. So I want to empower them to make the decisions that are going to support a cohesive narrative. And that means they can criticize my story ideas. They can bring me story ideas. When I look at their level, I'm going to say, well, this narratively, I need this. How do you want to give that to me? Or do you think there's a better way to represent that? Do you have another idea for this? So it's really collaboration and making sure that everyone understands it's not just you know, a chair that you're placing in the level. There's a reason for that to be there. It's part of the storytelling. It's part of the world. We're all working together. It's not me coming down from on high and giving you the story. And it's not the same with the player either. The player makes their own story. All of our team should be involved in making the story too. Yeah, and we're yeah. all like world logic puzzle masters, right? Like that's that's what our job is. Um, and like, I was working on some content and like I came in and they're like, okay, we're doing an admission in a theater. I was like, cool, you have like 7,000 exit points. They're like, no, there's not, there's no doors there. I'm like, every single one of those is a fire escape. That's how a theater is designed because I grew up in theater. I know that this is what like, and so like, they're like, why do you know this crap? And then like the next mission we worked on was in an aquarium. And I was like, we need to kill the dolphins. And they're like, why do you know this crap? And I'm like, that's what I used to want to be. Like I used to want to be a dolphin trainer. So I know a lot of stuff about dolphins and mm -hmm. they're not good animals. They are mm -mm. Dicks. They're so like, mean. Yeah, they are. So, but like nobody knew that. So I did like AMAs for like a week and a half explaining like all the ways dolphins suck so that they would feel okay with us killing the dolphins. Or echo. <laughs> for those who get their arms. And, uh, and that is me, I, I spent a lot of time working with uh, the game design team and the lead designer. Um, I spent a lot of time working with uh, the sound designer and the sound engineers because um, we, we do a lot of work together on that. Um, and then you spend a lot of time working with your producer because your producer really has a much bigger picture. And so um, on, on the current game that, that I just wrapped, uh, I also, uh, and this is pretty common for a lot of the games that I work on, I'll be in the voiceover sessions. So I'll either be directing the voiceover session co-directing it or I'll be sitting there ready to offer notes, comments, suggestions, make line changes. Uh, because when, when you're writing, especially uh, when you're doing game writing, script writing, you're writing a play, uh, you don't have a direct one-to-one -one relationship between you and, and your content, you know, uh, reader, right? You are, you are part of a process that, that goes through a number of other people, whether that's a director, an actor, uh, an art director, so on. And so, I look at the dialogue that I write as never being more than about 80% complete. Like it, I can get it to about 80%, but it takes, it takes a talented actor to pull it over the finish line. And so I wanna be there and hear it. And many times, especially for some of the dialogue that we do, 
if you have a if you have an A-list actor coming in, they may not do a lot of video games, so they may not, may not understand why they're doing the same line 20 different times, 20 different ways. And you have to provide context for them so that they can go, okay, I understand where this fits in the larger concept of the game. And uh, and also, there's just nothing quite as satisfying as, <laughs> as listening to somebody that you've watched on film for a number of years do your dialogue that you wrote at three o'clock in the morning and and kill it. Or and just on the plane it. on the way to the mm -hmm. session. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. It just it's just so awesome. You're just sitting there going, "Oh my god," you know. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's also a really fun aspect of the job. I, and this this is a good way to go into something I've been wanting to ask. Um, I know at least some of you. You know how these days we live in an age where comics become movies and games become movies, and you know there's different, and not always necessarily in that order. And so, um, for those of you um, that have worked on um, games that go into that that are related to other media, and there there must be some interesting issues with that beyond you know some of the obvious, like like your company getting permission to do it. Um, continuity, um, ensuring continuity between things, or just what's involved when you're doing these crossover things. Could uh, some of you that have been involved with that speak to that, Leanne? I have a quick example. One of my first games was a SpongeBob game for Natsume. And uh, it was a Nickelodeon All-Stars kind of thing where I had 12 characters from different different shows. So I had to watch a bunch of different shows, become familiar with the characters. And then we had a certain number of levels and we could have three lines at the beginning, three lines in the middle, three lines at the end. And SpongeBob had to be in the opening and closing cutscenes of every level. <laughs> so I had this Excel spreadsheet of, you know, who's in this one, who's in this one? How can I make sure that I'm giving all of the characters equal screen time? <laughs> equal screen time uh, but Spongebob also has to be the star so that was a fantastic challenge that I enjoyed very much <laughs> but writing for existing IP is a beautiful challenge of its own. So Anne how, how did you feel about uh, a certain programming ending up on, on Netflix that you might have worked for a property? Uh, uh, yeah well uh, <laughs> yeah like The Witcher is pretty cool but of course The Witcher the game was based on the novels um, so that you know it's pretty several layers and actually the show is is more based on the no novels than it is on the game however the game uh sorry the the show um borrows from the gameplay so you can see some of the gameplay kind of play out in, in the visuals which i think is really cool because that they they honor the source material which is the novels but they still honor the game medium which kind of made it famous outside of europe um, which i think is pretty amazing i also worked on a game that was based on a tv show and um, that was the TV show did not care about the game, and they actually killed off one of our playable races. <laughs> um, so we had to pretty much throw everything out and start over. So that was good times. Um, but of course, it was it was their IP, so they could kill off whoever they wanted. But they probably should have just maybe warned us. I don't I don't know. <laughs> like, hey, by the this way, this is literally the entirety of my job right now is <laughs> I'm working for Tom Clancy brand. I'm the Clancy narrative specialist. I for trying to protect the umbrella brand so that we don't screw each other over and trying to like maintain consistency across all of the projects in every single transmedia thing, all the super secret nonsense in every co collaborative medium you could possibly think of is what I'm on right now and an undisclosed number of projects on an undisclosed number of brands. Well, and like, but that's it. Like, yeah, I mean, the trick too is like, you know, uh, so somebody says, okay, you're going to get to write, you know, Ghostbusters. It's like somebody literally going here, here's our billion dollar toy. Don't, don't screw it up. And you, you have a real responsibility. Right. And so I've been very fortunate that I've worked on a lot of big IPs over the years and, and been able to play with a lot of amazing characters and worlds that other people have created. And I always consider my job is how do I honor what's come before yet add my own imprint onto it. Um, and so you're constantly kind of dashing in and out of canon, right? <laughs> Depending on where you are uh, in your in your storytelling. Um, I have created some canon characters for the Jurassic Park, Jurassic World franchise, which was super, super exciting, super thrilling. And, you know, with something like Ghostbusters, um, Ghostbusters, the video game is basically considered by most fans of Ghostbusters to be the Ghostbusters 3 movie that was never made. 
And so there's a there's a fun component to that, but it comes with a lot of responsibility. And that's uh, that's not only from the stakeholders or the IP holders, uh, but there's a fan base that's trailing a known IP and they have certain expectations and you have to always be aware of what they want or what they're expecting. Um, and, and you have to do your best to kind of hit those hit those marks. So it can be a challenge. When I worked on the last Avatar, the Airbender game, I was teaching at the time and uh, we were in Australia, so it was impossible to get some TV shows uh, legally. So my students would stay up until 1 a.m. torrenting <laughs> and they all came into university the next day and they're like, oh my gosh, did you see the end of Avatar? That was so amazing. I was like, oh yeah. And they went, you're a fan? I'm like, uh, and I couldn't tell them that I had watched the, you know, <laughs> the animated screens of it like six months in advance and had known all this time that they were in class saying, I can't believe it. I wonder what's going to happen next. And I was just going. Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> It's well, also the, the real pain is whenever you create a game and they make a movie out of it and completely hash everything that you've done. Uh, because we had Dungeon Siege, which got turned into In the Name of the King, which was god awful. Uh, and and besides the fact that it, that it had a couple of names of characters in common, they didn't pay any attention to what I had done. Um, but anyway, no, um, but that's very real, and that's it just is and that comes down to communication collaboration and trust right and if you don't yeah. build those relationships you don't build that trust you don't have a seat at the table and people often get worried that you're trying to control and it's like no everything we're doing is additive and supportive like mm -hmm. me coming and telling you like here here are all the red flags so you can either choose to ignore them Mm -hmm. Or you can choose to do something about it before it's too late. And like, yeah. if, if we can do that, the earlier you get narrative in, the sooner we can be like, hey, guys, you accidentally made a colonizer fantasy. And I don't think that was your intention. Right. Mm -hmm. Or like this gameplay is accidentally like reinforcing this. Right. Like you, you, the unintended narrative of things that you get kind of desensitized to because you look at it without context. Right. You look at it as an individual piece without looking at it as holistically and as part of the additive experience and like, okay, are we actually supporting ourselves or are we actually creating new little roadblocks that are making it harder for us to actually achieve the goal that we set forward? And the only way that you get through that stuff is through clear communication and trust. Well, it goes to what you said really early on too, Lauren, which is, you know, um, you can't be precious about your work because if you're a writer you're already going to get stomped on 20 different ways to Sunday just because that's just a, a, a part of the process. Everyone but, can do words. Right, 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 right. Well, everybody's got a keyboard. Everybody's got some sort of word processor. So everyone's a writer. So, of course, it's easy for us to go in and start noodling with all of your stuff. That That's just part of the reality of the life you live. Um, but specifically with, uh, you know, large stakeholders, IP holders and everything else, uh, whenever they bump into something that that I've either done or they wanted something that I didn't quite nail, I'm always just like, great, let's fix it. Let's make it work for you. OK, it has to work for you. If it's not working for you, it can't work for anybody else. And so whatever it takes, let's jump in and let's get it right. And if you have that attitude, um, pretty soon people start to trust you. And then the notes become less and less, you know. The first time through, you're getting two pages of notes. The next time through, you're getting a page of notes. The next time through, you're getting four notes. So on the last on the last uh, script that I did, I had 4,000 lines of an incidental dialogue. 4,000 lines, right? <laughs> you guys know that's a lot of lines. And it, it, took me, uh, it took me a not insignificant amount of time to do them, but I did them in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, they all went to the studio simultaneously. It came back, five line changes. That's it. That's great. That is an you know, amazing but, ratio. But, but the relationship had been built before that. You know, if I hadn't built the relationship in advance, I would have gotten back 20 pages of notes. But because oh, I knew where I was going. And you knew the tone. Right. I knew where I was going. I knew who I had to deal with. And I knew the people in charge that were going to be making the approval process work. I addressed it in advance. I addressed it before I needed to, to get the note. And so, yeah, it's things you have to do like that that, that yeah. allow you to survive. <laughs> That is that is a great observation. I um, believe we're about out of time here, but um, I think that you know we've we you have given people some a good glimpse of what it can be like to be down in the trenches where you are with having to work with others and uh, 
um, work with client and meet client expectations. Uh, it's it's a it's a tricky path to navigate, but um, you're all to be congratulated for being able to do it. It's so rewarding. I would recommend anyone do it. Just be tenacious. You can get that. Good. Kill your yeah. ego and be tenacious. Exactly. Yeah, you got your right. <laughs> it's the most super fun job in the world. It really is. It can be stressful and it can be hard and it is a job, but it's also one of the most rewarding you could possibly do.